But we're going to continue to walk through a message that we started two weeks ago entitled The Mission of Jesus. The Mission of Jesus. And we started out by saying this. This is an important statement that we have to understand about the mission of Jesus. And that is this. That the mindset of Christians must be the mission of Jesus. The mindset of Christians must be the mission of Jesus. When you get saved, when you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior and God comes into your life and into your heart, everything changes. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. How many thankful for that this morning? All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. You have a new direction and new desires. You have new motives. You have a new way of living. You have a way that God wants you to live. And all of that starts in your mind. Because if you think differently, then you'll act differently. We believe and we see in life and in the scriptures that our beliefs determine our behavior. What you believe about something will determine how you act. Truthfully, if you think about it, what you believe about God will determine how you respond to God. What you believe about church and about spirituality and about the Bible will determine what you, what you act out. If you believe something in your mind, then you're gonna act it out in your behaviors. And if we're not careful, sometimes we can allow things to get into our minds that cause us to have behaviors that God never intended. We can allow fears and thoughts of anxiety and worry and, and overwhelming thoughts and, and thoughts of I'm not in control anymore and thoughts I don't know what to do. And those thoughts literally control the direction of our lives. God never intended that. And so God comes to us and he says, listen, as a Christian, the mindset that you need to have is the mission of Jesus Jesus Christ came from heaven to earth and he was born as a virgin in a stable. We celebrate that birth on Christmas and the Bible says that he came for one purpose, to seek and to save the lost. He came to die, lived 33 and a half years, died on a cross, was buried and praise God the third day. He rose again proving that he was God. The tomb is empty this morning. The grave it was overcome. Sin and death are defeated because Jesus Christ has risen from the grave. He had a mission and he could completed that mission and then we find in the book of Philippians where Paul says hey listen the way that Jesus went about living his life is the same way you need to go about living your life well that's easier said than done because sometimes we have the best intentions but not always the best actions how's your how's your new year's resolutions doing sometimes we have the best intentions but not the best actions right some of you woke up on January 1st, you said, I'm never eating an Oreo again. Oreos are done. They're dead to me, right? How's that going, okay? How's that doing? Some of you got up and said, man, I'm going to get on the gym. I'm going to get there, man, every day. I'm, I know I'm not exercised for 745 days, but tomorrow I'm starting every day. I'm telling you why I'm going to have my own show, and they're going to do videos on YouTube of me exercising. How's that going? You see, sometimes we have the best intentions, but not always the best actions. What needs to happen is we need to shift our minds. Because when we shift our minds, our behaviors will follow. So the question we have to ask ourselves is, how did Jesus complete his mission? We know what he did. We know he died. We know that he lived on this earth. He did miracles. We know that he was the sacrifice. But how did he go about doing it? Because how he went about doing it is how we need to go about living our lives as Christians. We said two weeks ago, we started by saying this. We saw, first of all, the first thing about how he went about doing it was, number one, we see the humility, the humility of Jesus. The Bible says in Philippians chapter 2, in verse in number 5, it says, Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. And it says, Who being the form of God, thought not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. And took upon him the form of a servant. Verse 8 says, And being found in human form, he humbled himself. Humbled himself. Jesus completed his mission. He, he did what his father wanted him to do, but he did it in a humble way. He was humble about his mission. He didn't go around bragging and saying, hey, look at me, I'm the son of God. Hey, look at me, I'm the savior of the world. No, he served his disciples. He washed his disciples' feet. He, he took time for the youngest child who wanted to come up and say hello to him. He spent time with the doubt, down and outers. He spent time with those who were lost in religion. He was humble about it. And so many times in our lives, we think that in order to get somewhere, we've got to be somebody. 
We got to get somewhere. So now I got to make sure everybody knows who, who I am and, and what I've done. And look at my resume. And look at my position. And look at my accomplishments. And yet Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who is the Savior of the world, the Bible says he humbled himself and got on the ground. He humbled himself and washed his disciples' feet. He humbled himself and let people spit in his face. He humbled himself and let them put nails in his hands and his feet and pluck his beard out and mock him. And we get upset when someone doesn't recognize our position. We get upset when someone doesn't recognize who we are. We get upset when someone doesn't give us the accolades that, that, we, that we deserve. I'll tell you, that's a worldly mindset. That's a cultural mindset. That's not the mindset of a Christian. The mindset of a Christian is humility. Humble. He humbled himself. Became obedient unto death. Even the death of the cross. We see that he was humble. But then we see, secondly, how did he complete his mission? We see, secondly, not only the humility of Jesus, this is where we'll pick up here in this, in this week, we see the obedience of Jesus. The obedience of Jesus. He was humble and he was obedient. The Bible says in verse number eight, it says, by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death of a cross. I want you to notice a couple of things about his obedience. Number one, his obedience was uncomfortable. The Bible says that he became obedient to the point of death. It was so uncomfortable that his obedience to his father, if he was going to fulfill his father's mission, he had to humble himself and then be obedient even to the point where it made him uncomfortable, obedient to the point of death. He said, I'm going to be so obedient to my father, I'm going to do everything my father says, and even if that means I have to die, that's okay, because my obedience is what matters. It's not about what's comfortable for me. It's not about how I feel about things. Hey, if God wants me to do it, I'm going to obey it. And we understand this, that God is calling us to obey. But the question I have to ask you is this, do you only obey God when it's comfortable? That's called the pastor pause right there when you do that. Let that sink in a little bit. <laughs> We're good at obeying as long as it keeps us where we want to be. We're good at obeying God. Oh, hey, I'll obey God, but I mean to a certain point. Because after that, then, you know, if I have to be uncomfortable... Well, that's not, that's not what I think God's called me to do. The Bible says he became obedient unto death. Unto death. If that means I have to sacrifice my life, listen, God loved you so much, Jesus loves you so much that he was willing to die for you, to be obedient, to be uncomfortable for you. And sometimes we say, hey, do you mind coming out maybe two weeks in a row? I mean, two weeks, Pastor Steve, come on now. And, we, and God is asking you to do some things. God is asking you to be obedient. And sometimes we have this mentality that says, well, you know what? I, God's called me to be a Christian, which means I should never have problems. I should never be uncomfortable. I should never be challenged. I love Christianity. I love church. As long as I can have it made in the shade with lemonade, that's not the kind of mindset that you need to have. We need to have a mindset that says I'm obedient even when it pushes me to a place where I'm a little uncomfortable. A little uncomfortable. Pushes me to a place or may I have to give some of my resources? I've got to give some of my time. I've got to give some of the things that are important. I've got to put myself last and others first. God's not calling you to do anything that he hasn't already done. He's sacrificed. He's given. He's loved. He's, he's given away his resources. We see his obedience was uncomfortable. But I want you to notice this. His obedience was unconventional. It's interesting that the Bible says this. It says that he became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. It's interesting that the Bible would take that and put that phrase in there, almost reminding us that, yes, he was obedient enough to die. But that was uncomfortable in itself. But the fact that he had to die on a cross, why? That's so unconventional. It's almost not necessary. It's almost something uh, that doesn't make sense. I mean, if, if I'm Jesus and I say, okay, God, I'll go down to earth. I'll be born in a manger. I'll sacrifice. But maybe like, I don't know, if I have to die, can I just like, you know, can you just like take me out real quick? Maybe just take my breath away. Maybe, maybe just have me trip and fall and hit my head and I'll, I'll die. It's unconventional that, that, that Jesus would die on a cross. It seems, it's, it's almost seems like it doesn't make sense. There's a lot of different ways that Jesus could have died. There's a lot of easier, simple ways that Jesus could have died. 
But God said, I want you to be obedient to me unto death, uncomfortable, and the death of a cross, unconventional. Here's the question I ask you. Do you only obey God when it makes sense? You see, sometimes we'll allow ourselves to be pushed to an uncomfortable place. And we'll say, okay, God, I'll obey you. I'll follow you. I'll do what you asked me to do. And it's a little uncomfortable. But then God asks you to take another step that doesn't seem to make sense. And that's where we stop. And we say to ourselves, well, you know, I don't understand, you know, because if God was in it, it would, make, it would make more sense. And if God was in it, it would make sense to me. It doesn't really make sense to me why God would want me to do this. It seems a little unconventional. You know, it really didn't make sense to Noah when God said, go build an ark. It's going to rain. Okay, God, what's rain? It's this stuff that falls from the sky. Okay, it's never done that. Oh, you want to build like a little boat, like a little skiv or something like that for me and my family, like a little thing? No, no, no. It's going to take you 120 years. You don't think some people walked by and said, Noah, what are you doing? Okay, here we go. All right, I ain't going to believe this, but there's God, right? It's rain. What's rain? Okay, I ask the same question. It's going to come down. Scott, it's going to flood the whole earth. Everybody's going to be destroyed. And, and, and then we're going we're gonna to all uh, perish. But if you get on the ark with all the animals, this is a huge ark. And I'm gonna, I'm, I have like 100 years left to build it. But in 100 years, you come on. All, you, 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 you know those people. And he's talking to them like, okay, hey, hey, you have a great day, Noah. All right, wonderful. All right? All right, good talking with you. Unconventional. You see, sometimes we're unwilling to obey God because it doesn't make sense to us. You see, obedience is a sacrifice. When we obey, God is calling us to sacrifice, to live in a place of humility, to live in a place of, of obedience, a sacrifice. The Bible says in Romans chapter 12, in verse number one, it says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. When we obey God, we are spiritually worshiping God, and we need to offer God what he has asked us for. Here's the question. What do you need to offer to God today? What is it that God is asking you for? For some of you, God is asking you just for your Sunday mornings. And yet we're unwilling, because it's not comfortable. It's not, it's not conventional. Sometimes God is asking you to, to, to follow him and to obey him and to stop chasing this dream that you think will get you someplace and make you somebody. God is calling you to be on mission. And what is that mission? To be humble. What is that mission? To be obedient, to offer to God your time, your treasure, your family, to offer to God your future, to offer to God your fears, to offer to God the things that he's given to you as a sacrifice back to him in obedience. Listen, all all throughout the Bible, we see that God asked people to sacrifice. God asked Hannah to offer up Samuel. Hannah said, hey, if you give me a child, I know I'm barren, but if you give me a child, I will give them back to you. For some, you need to do that. You need to give your family to God. You need to say, God, you have my family. I'm no longer going to try to figure this out. Uh, some of you men in this room need to get on your knees. I'm telling you what we're preaching now. you got to get on your knees and say, God, help me. I'm the leader of this family. And by the way, the men are the leader of the home. The men are the, supposed to be the spiritual leaders who step up and take charge and, and, and lead in a direction that God wants them to go. And I'm not saying I'm perfect either, but I'm telling you, fellas, we need each other and we need help and we can't do it on our own. And why don't you say, God, you know what? I'm going to give you my family. Listen, it's about time we start stop living by emotion and start living with some convictions some convictions and say you know what it doesn't matter what the wind blows it doesn't matter the political climate it doesn't matter what people are saying on the news hey listen I live my life by some convictions I stand for truth I stand for what's right and by the grace of God I'm going to do what's right I'm going to obey no matter how I feel no matter what I face I'm going to live with conviction by the way I'm really happy about this in case you're wondering I'm thankful to be here today I'll tell you, but we go whichever the way the wind blows. And God is asking you, he's calling upon you. He's challenging you to step up and have the mindset that says, God, I'm going to start living with some convictions. I'm going to offer to you what you've given to me. We see Hannah offered Samuel. Hannah sacrificed because she was grateful to the Lord. She was thankful to the Lord for what he had given to her. And he said, how can, she said, how can I not? We see another, another one. We see that, that Abraham offered up Isaac because he was obedient to the Lord. 
The Bible says that, that God came to Abraham and said, I want you to sacrifice, I want you to give. I want you to give your only son. It was uncomfortable, it was unconventional, but he wanted them to do it, to say, hey, do you love me? Or will you obey me only when it's easy? Or when I ask you to do something difficult, when I ask you to sacrifice, will you hold back on me? We see Abraham offered up Isaac, I love this, God offered up Jesus for you. The Bible says in, in John chapter three and verse number 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life, God sacrifice because he wants you to believe in the Lord. What has, done for, what has God done for you? Let me walk through it. I love John 3, 16. First of all, God loves you. God loves you. John 3, 16 says, for God so loved the world. God loves you. We see God gave his son for you, that he gave his only son for you. God invites you to believe. Whoever believes in him will not perish. God will save you, should not perish, but have eternal life. Listen, God loves you. He saves you. He sacrificed his son for you. He offers you a way of salvation for you. He loves you so much. Listen, if you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus Christ as your savior, can I remind you of the love that God has for you, that he came from heaven to earth, was sacrificed, was obedient, un un uncomfortable, unconventional, but he did it for you because he loves you. He loves all of you. He loves everything that you are. He loves all your mistakes. He loves everything about you, and he offers you a way of salvation this morning. You don't need to reject him. You don't need to wonder. You don't need to try to be a good person. God made a way for you. He's done all of that for you, and if you just simply accept him as your savior, he will save you. He will cleanse you. He will forgive you. He will redeem you. He will set you free from sin. He will help you he will give you purpose and listen if God has done all of that for us there's that pastor pause again then what are we not willing to do for him to give a little of our time to give a little of our money to give a little bit to jump in a group or help serve somewhere that's all he's asking we need to be obedient you see Jesus was humble Jesus was obedient and then we see how did he go about how did he go about his mindset he was humble he was obedient and then we see the authority of Jesus verse number nine says therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him a name that is above every name so the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under earth. And every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. His name has a position. I love that. His name says, his, therefore God has highly exalted him. His name has an exalted position. His name has an eternal position. The Bible says, and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. As in there will never be a name. No matter what happens, no matter what's going on, there will never be a name above the name of Jesus. It means his position, his name is exalted. His name is eternal. There will never, never be something or someone greater than Jesus. Let me say that again. There will never be someone or something greater than Jesus. COVID is not a greater name than Jesus. A variant is not a greater name than Jesus. Some political pundit is not a greater name than Jesus. Something in your life is not greater than Jesus. There will never be a greater name than Jesus. And if that's the case, if that is true, then here's the question. Why do we live like there's a greater name than Jesus? Oh, I know, Pastor, Jesus is the name above our name. But, you know, have you heard about the new variant? Have you got that name yet? I'm still trying to remember the last couple. I'm trying to keep up. You say, oh, pastor, I know the name of Jesus is exalted, but have you, have you heard about what's going on in Washington, D.C.? Have you heard about this name? I'm going to tell you this. I know the names. I know what's going on. But I just believe that God's word is true. I just believe that God wants us to live by conviction and not emotion. And if I'm going to live by conviction, one of my convictions is going to be that the name of Jesus is greater than any other name. There will never be another name greater than the name of Jesus. Oh, we were worried. We were scared. Man, we were wondering, what's going to happen? How are we going to survive? What's going to happen? What twists and turns are going to happen? Can I remind you something? It's been a long time, and we're still here. We're doing just fine. God's church is moving forward. 
Man, we're still seeing people saved and baptized and, and come to Christ. Hey, it's okay. You know what? Hey, they can spit out all the names they want on the news. They can spit out all the names they want on social media. I'm still going to declare the name that's above every name, the name of Jesus Christ, who's greater than fear, who's greater than worry, who's greater than politics, who's greater than anything that we can face or feel. I'll tell you, his name has power. It says, so in the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. All those powerful, those powerful men that we see on the news, one day, that knee's going to bow. Maybe this knee. Maybe both knees. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That politician that you think, oh, man, if he, if he, if he get, we're all, it's done. Oh, if that happens, we're done. That knee's going to bow to the King of kings and Lord of lords. His name has power. And listen, if every knee is going to bow someday, then I want to make sure my knee bows today. I'm going to make sure that in my life I'm not going to live like there's a greater name. Because if I'm going to have to bow someday, I might as well bow now and say, Lord, I give to you. Your name is powerful. Your name is mighty. Your name is strong. Your name is holy. Your name is great, and I'm not going to live like there's a greater name. I'm not going to live like there's a more powerful name. I'm not going to live like there's something greater than you. Why? Because he has all authority. Every knee will bow, and we will confess the truth about him. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God, the Father. You see, the authority of Jesus should cause us to speak boldly, to be bold about our faith, you know why? Because a scared world needs a fearless church. A scared world needs a fearless church. A group of Christians who come together and just believe what the Bible says. Believe and think the way that Jesus thought when he was on this earth. How did he think? He was humble. How did he think? He was obedient. How did he think? He had all power. And greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And I want to encourage you today. I pray this message would encourage you and challenge you to believe God is who he says he is and that there is hope, that hope has a name, and we can trust and rest in the name that's above every name. Can we pray together? Lord, we love you so much. God, thank you for who you are.